It may be that with age comes wisdom, but with age also comes Alzheimer's, atherosclerosis, arthritis, cancer, and diabetes. What if we could keep the wisdom and do without the rest? Wouldn't we all take a dip in the fountain of youth? And yet all folklore across the world attributes a flavor of immorality to such a wish, as opposed to the modesty associated with the acceptance of aging. And there is a reason for this. Aging has always been unavoidable. Thus, wishing to avoid it has always been seen as madness. But how many things were accepted by humanity in the past that are now unacceptable? We don't accept starving, being cold in the winter, not being able to travel. We don't even accept poor Wi-Fi connection and not being able to choose between five different types of latte. Yes, but aging is natural, so it should be accepted, right? Yet notably, we openly fight cancer, heart disease, degenerative diseases. Aren't these natural? So is aging inevitable? What is aging exactly? And what would happen if we could all live longer or forever? In order to understand aging, we need to understand that we are the product of evolution and not of intelligent design. The reason we age and die is not because aging and dying serve a purpose. If anything, in terms of biological purpose, staying young and living longer should give more chance to reproduce. But in evolution, the probability of external factors also plays a role. Statistically speaking, our ancestors were highly likely to die before the age of 30 because of an infectious disease an accident or a predator. So apes who were genetically predisposed to live longer than 100 or even 200 did not have a great evolutionary advantage back then, as death by old age was rare. If we look at animals that do live quite long, we see that they have evolved biological features that keep them young. Sharks are apex predators, so they live for hundreds of years, and their teeth regrow when they're worn out. Clams are sheltered by their shells, and so they evolved biological mechanisms to live up to 500 years old. When people are asked if they wish to live longer, the answer is not unanimously yes. Being old is not perceived as a nice thing, so people would rather not live longer if it means being decrepit for decades. But ask people if they wish to spend more of their given life in a youthful state, or if they wish they could reverse their age, and nearly everyone will say yes. So, will that ever be possible? The answer to this question might be yes, and sooner than you think. So if you look at how, what happened is like for thousands of years, people were aging and dying. And because it, see, it seemed to be naturally, people, we have woven it into our religion, our culture, that we tell ourselves that's the natural course of things. Fact is, it's just a disease everybody of us is suffering from. And a disease we can name, I'm very convinced we someone will be able to cure. The last 15 years have seen incredible advances in the science of aging. Our understanding of the biological mechanisms that result in aging is improving at a very fast pace. And solutions are being investigated that would slow down and even reverse aging. There is even talk of longevity escape velocity, which would occur when we reverse aging faster than it advances naturally. If somebody is 40 at the moment, he or she has 45 good years in front of him or her in the current life expectancy. So in these 45 years, think about the optionality, like the, the, the pace of innovation is happening. In these 45 years, we're going to see success in pushing life expectancy. I believe that we have a 50% chance of reaching what I have called longevity escape velocity within about 15 years from now. The longevity escape velocity is the rate at which we need to be improving the comprehensiveness of rejuvenation therapies in order to stay one step ahead of the aging problem so that we can continue to rejuvenate people as the years go by even though the actual objective difficulty of rejuvenating progressively older people 
is nevertheless increasing. So some people have called this point the Methuselarity, where we get to be able to stay one step ahead of the problem and improve the therapies. What is your reaction to this idea? Is it acceptance, excitement, or skepticism? If you're skeptical, you're not alone. It's perfectly reasonable for people, especially non-biologists, to be skeptical about the prospects of bringing aging under comprehensive medical control anytime soon. We've known about aging since the beginning of civilization. We've known how ghastly it is. And people have been coming along regularly saying that they knew how to defeat aging and they've always been wrong. So it's reasonable to be hesitant before you believe the next person who comes along and says that thing. However, the more you look at the actual specifics about how much we know about aging, how many new tools are coming along to do medicine better than we can today, quite soon, you know, it becomes much more plausible that we might actually be on the brink of really achieving it this time. What I believe though, is that everybody who's around 40 might realistically have the chance to live as long as he or she wants to live. But I deeply believe that our human nature is not made for eternity. So there will come the point, but maybe for some people, the point comes at 80 years, and maybe for some people, the point comes at, uh, at 500 years, where a human says, you know what, I had it. Like, I wanna be out of here. I wanna see what's next. I had enough birthdays or whatsoever, yeah. So, there, so I think there is a natural ending we want, but I think the ultimate libertarian dream, and I'm very libertarian, is that we will be able to decide on our own uh, when our day of death is. We're going to throw a party and say, I had it all, love you all, and I'm out of here. In order to separate fact from fiction, we need to first take a few moments to dig into the science, as we like doing here at Rational Mind. Let's first have a quick look at a bit of biology. Organisms such as humans are made of organs, organs are made of tissue, and tissues are collections of cells. Cells are building blocks and also small machines that carry out all the work, functions, growth and repair of the organs and, in turn, of the whole organism. Being little machines, cells need energy to operate. The energy is generated by mitochondria, little organelles within the cell. Cells are made up of different proteins, which in turn have different functions, for example, moving things around the cell, making new things, or providing structure. The instructions on how to make each protein is stored in a gene, like a blueprint. A gene is simply a portion of the DNA molecule. The DNA is a long chain of small molecules called nucleotides. Each nucleotide carries one of four bases, each identified by a letter. These encode information according to how they're sequenced. This information is then copied by the RNA, a molecule similar to the DNA. The RNA acts as a messenger between the gene and the protein it makes. Each cell contains DNA in its nucleus. This gives the cell the ability to make new copies of itself by using the blueprint available in the DNA. When it is time to make a new cell, the very long and loose DNA chain winds itself up into a structure called a chromosome, which is a compacted form of DNA. This makes it easier for it to get into the new cell. At the ends of the chromosomes, there are telomeres, which are like end caps on shoelaces. These prevent the chromosomes from fraying and losing bits of DNA and the information within it. In a human, there are 200 different types of cells. For example, we have liver cells, brain cells, and eye cells. So how does a cell know what it is, and how does it make more of its kind? After all, the DNA contained in every cell encodes the blueprint for the whole organism. To answer this, we need to understand the difference between the genome and the epigenome. The genome is the set of genes within the DNA, which are the set of blueprints on how to make each protein. To make a protein, a gene is transcribed by the RNA and translated into a protein. But how does the RNA know where to read along the DNA to make a specific protein needed by a specific cell? The RNA knows which genes to transcribe based on some chemical tags attached to the genes, which work a bit like on or off switches. The set of these tags and instructions is known as the epigenome. The epigenome determines which genes in a cell are expressed and which are muted, and therefore also what kind of cell is being made, how many are made, and when. 
Imagine the genome is like a master plan for the whole city. And each gene within the genome is the blueprint of a different building within the city. And the epigenome is the urban planner deciding what gets built, where and when. The genome has information for the whole organism. The epigenome gives identity to each cell by tagging what genes are relevant to the cell and which are not. But while the genome is supposed to be mutable in an organism, the epigenome is more variable throughout life. It is affected by external factors, a bit like nature versus nurture, especially in early life. At the early stages of an embryo, cells acquire their identity via the epigenome. So for example, identical twins typically begin life with almost identical epigenomes. But environmental exposure can alter an organism's epigenome, which in turn determines what genes are expressed or muted. This explains why older twins can look quite different and are affected by different diseases. For instance, habits such as smoking, exercise, and many other environmental factors affect which genes the epigenome turns on or off. And now we are ready to understand how we age. Scientists have identified nine processes which cause aging, known as the hallmarks of aging. Number one, genomic instability. Damage to our genome occurs daily because of external factors such as UV light or viruses, or internal factors such as replication errors when making new cells. Second, mitochondrial damage. Remember, mitochondria are the energy source of the cells. Damage to mitochondria is associated with cellular dysfunction and in turn with aging. Third, telomere attrition. Telomeres protect the end of the chromosomes, but every time they replicate, they become shorter, eventually leaving the genes unprotected at the ends and prone to damage. Fourth, epigenetic alterations. We have seen that the epigenome is more variable than the genome. This can cause epigenetic alterations which are detrimental to health, for example, if some cancerous genes are accidentally switched on. With time, the epigenome accumulates errors which are associated with the rise of other hallmarks of aging and with aging in general. Fifth, cellular senescence. A senescent cell is a cell that reached the end of its cycle, which means it can no longer replicate itself. Senescence is a good thing because it stops damaged cells from replicating and becoming cancerous. However, with time and age, the elimination mechanisms become less effective and senescent cells accumulate. The accumulation of senescent cells might be linked to many age-related diseases such as arthritis and cancer. Number six, loss of proteostasis. Protein homeostasis or proteostasis is the good functioning of all proteins in our body and correct disposal of dysfunctional ones. With time, these mechanisms become less effective at eliminating damaged proteins and the damaged proteins may create disease. An example of this is Alzheimer's disease, caused by the accumulation of two types of damaged proteins which go around and cause more damage. The seventh hallmark of aging is deregulated nutrient sensing. Cellular activities are all the natural functions that occur in the cell, such as transporting nutrients, replication, and transmission of nerve impulses. All of this activity needs fuel. If cells sense that the fuel is abundant, cellular activity and metabolism speed up. Over time, the pathways that signal nutrient levels deteriorate. For example, when the insulin pathways are affected, this causes diabetes. When nutrient sensing is not optimal, faster cellular activity occurs, leading to faster accumulation of cell damage and rapid aging. Number eight, stem cell exhaustion. Stem cells are blank cells. They have no specific identity to begin with and can transform into nearly any kind of human cell. Having stem cells available in the system allows for growth and regeneration of tissue, like having the raw materials to build or fix something. With age, stem cells in your body run out, eventually causing problems to your organs and immune system. And finally, number nine, altered intercellular communication. Aging does not simply affect each small component of the body, but also the system as a whole. All the damage and aging from cells and tissues affects adjacent cells and tissues, which can reduce the cell's ability to communicate with each other and maintain internal and external balance. This causes chronic inflammation, which affects the immune system 
and can cause things like cancer and atherosclerosis. And so altogether, those nine causes or hallmarks of aging seem to drive the majority of the aging process, leading to diseases and eventually death. And so we in the field are researching ways to slow, hopefully not just one of these hallmarks, but many of them. Before getting into recent research and therapies, there is one last question to answer. If we are going to talk about reversing aging, then how do we measure aging other than chronological age? The number of times the Earth goes around the sun isn't as important as your biological age, which is how fast your, your biological clock is ticking. And we can measure that accurately. We can take a blood sample or a swab of your cheek and say within maybe just a few years how old your body actually is and whether you need to slow the aging process down or not and even predict when you're likely to die. In 2011, Steve Horvath and his team discovered that the biological age of an organism can be determined by observing one of the epigenetic markers, methylation. Methyl is a chemical that attaches to the genes and marks them as switched off, essentially tagging the genes. As cells replicate over time, the methylation accumulates as well. It is possible by observing methylation to know the age of the organism. This is called the epigenetic clock, or Horvath clock. The Horvath clock made possible recent and significant breakthroughs. In 2019, Gregory Fay and his peers published a paper with the very first evidence of age reversal achieved in humans. Fay and his team were looking for a way to restore the thymus, a gland responsible for the production of T-cells, essential to the immune system. The thymus deteriorates with age, and especially in the two, three years preceding death using FDA-approved substances such as recombinant human growth hormone together with metformin and DHEA, they managed to partially regrow the useful portion of the thymus in older men. Incidentally, other benefits were observed, such as a reduced risk of prostate cancer. So the biological age of the subjects was measured using the Horvath clock and other epigenetic clocks, and it was noted that age had been reversed by almost two years in all subjects of the study. This was a small study with no control group, and a wider control study is now underway. Another significant breakthrough was achieved by biologist David Sinclair. One of the major parts of the epigenome is called DNA methylation. These are little chemicals that the cells add to our DNA as we're developing in the womb. And it's what specifies a cell's function and type. So a brain cell in our body will have a very different chemical pattern of methylation on its DNA compared to a liver cell or a skin cell. And that is part of what makes those cells remember what they should be doing. Of course, we don't want our brain to start behaving like skin anytime soon, it won't work. And that's what DNA, DNA methylation is about. And there's thousands, hundreds of thousands actually, of these little chemical marks that get added and stuck on our DNA when we're very young. The problem is that as we get older, some of these marks get taken away, they get clipped off and some of them get added on in places that they shouldn't be. And our cells eventually lose their ability to function the way they should. And you can think of the, the old brain starting to behave more like skin and the old skin starting to behave more like a liver. And that's what we think is driving the majority of the aging process. Noting that methylation and other alterations to the epigenome were a clear indication of biological age, Sinclair was investigating whether the epigenome could be restored to its original youthful state. A great idea came to the rescue. In 2006, Shinya Yamanaka demonstrated that four specific genes known as Yamanaka factors can be used to convert any type of somatic cells into pluripotent stem cells. Somatic cells are any non-reproductive cell in the human body, such as brain cells, liver cells, and so on. The ability to convert somatic cells into stem cells allows us to repair disease, dysfunctional or damaged tissues and organs. Yamanaka received the 2012 Nobel Prize for his discovery, which gave rise to a new field of regenerative medicine known as stem cell therapy. How does this apply to reversing aging? The process of converting a somatic cell, for instance, a fat cell or a skin cell into a stem cell can be described as a reprogramming of the cell. It reverses the epigenome of the cell to its initial blank state, like in an embryonic stem cell. 
Sinclair used three of the Yamanaka factors in an interrupted reprogramming. This interrupted reprogramming allowed Sinclair to reset a cell's epigenome to its youthful state. This is achieved by interrupting the process at the right time, while the cell is a young version of itself, but before it becomes a blank stem cell. In this way, the cells become younger, but the epigenome that gives them the identity, such as skin cell or liver cell, is preserved. In December 2020, a paper was published demonstrating how this process restored vision in mice with a deteriorated or crushed optic nerve by reprogramming the cells in the nerve back to the youthful state. When an egg is fertilized, when we're very, very young, the cell has a way of resetting the clock, the biological clock. So those little chemicals, the DNA methylations, get stripped off and the cell is basically an, at age zero. And there are genes that do that. There are what are called Yamanaka factors. These are essentially four or more genes that come on when we're very young. What we did in our work was to turn on three of those Yamanaka genes in the adult, in this case, the eye of an old mouse. And that was sufficient for the cell to reset the clock, not back to zero, but about halfway and rejuvenate the tissue. And so that the, the mice got their vision back the promise is that this process could be used to turn the Horvath clock backward, eventually being able to reverse aging in humans. Imagine having a pill that has a few chemicals in it from plants and you take it for maybe a month and you really start to look different. Your hair might grow back, your skin looks good and your internal organs also reset going back a decade or two. That's what we're aiming for. We're still a while away from having this type of treatment on humans. But in the meantime, all the other hallmarks are being tackled in various innovative ways by private companies. Some might be able to offer treatments very soon, with many already at the early stages of regulatory approval. So at Retuberon, we target three, which we believe uh, most important hallmark of aging, which is stem cell depletion, senescent cells, and telomere shortening. So on stem cell depletion, we are actually working on a novel drug discovery and development approach. So in this approach, we apply small molecules to regulate our own stem and progenitor cells to repair and regenerate organs and tissues. Or in other words, we instruct our body to heal itself. In a, in a second project, we, uh, we approach senescent cells. I think many of us by now know they accumulate by age and they inhibit actually the proliferation of what I just mentioned before to regenerate organs and tissues in a healthy way and keep them functioning. So in, in our third project, we are working um, on telomere shortening and the telomeres are basically protecting our DNA and the healthy state of our body. A group of scientists at Cambrian have discovered a way to slow down the rate at which our old cells are producing new proteins, because as we age, our cells get worse and worse and worse at making proteins when they're pushed to the brink of trying to manufacture new proteins as fast as they possibly can. And so we've created a molecule that slows down the rate of protein translation and in so doing increases the number of healthy proteins in the cell. And we've shown in model organisms that this extends the lifespan of nematode worms dramatically. And we think that it can do similarly impressive things in humans. And we're looking forward to testing that molecule there. This is all very promising and reveals a very important aspect of the current science of aging. The focus is on disease prevention and on the increase of health span rather than directly on lifespan. A lifespan increase is a consequence of the increased health and youthfulness but not necessarily the intended objective. We are really focusing on not even have these hallmarks of aging as opposed to how medicines are being taken today or approached today is that we discover we have a disease and then we try to heal it with the approach of addressing these hallmarks of aging processes we prevent even the deterioration of these organs and tissues and keep our body healthy and expand the health span accordingly. 
Scientists and businesses alike seem very optimistic about the fact that in a matter of years or decades at most, we will be able to defeat aging and the diseases associated with it. One of the things that we've been looking at, at doing is finding what changes happen in the heart after we're born to prevent it from regenerating. And we've been able to find some molecules that can actually reprogram the cells in our heart to go backwards to their embryonic states so that they can then look at the damage around them and start repairing the adult heart as if it were the fetal heart. But with this optimism also come questions and doubts. What will be the impact on society? Will it only be positive? Who will be able to access this technology? And how soon can we expect it? If you look in the last 40 years, the waves of growth in the world have been because we added new parts of the world to the globalized free trade zone niche, so to say. So first, uh, when the Iron Wall fell, all the Eastern European companies joined, so to say, the capitalistic world, and then China, now India, somewhere in Africa. So we always have these waves of new people and new regions joining the world economy. So, but somewhere hopefully the whole world is, is unified as an economy or is at least interlinked and at the same pace. And then I believe actually the next wave of growth positively will be longevity because so many people will stay active and, and be part of, of a productive life. If we don't figure out a way to keep our aging populations healthier, then we have a real problem on our hands. And it's medicines that are gonna keep people over the age of 65 healthy and vital into their 80s, 90s, and beyond that can prevent us from running headfirst into all of the problems of an aging population that we're already seeing in the developed world. And we're going to see more and more in the developing world over the course of the 21st century. In the last 150 years, humanity has managed to almost double life expectancy across the globe. This was the result of fighting infectious disease, providing more and better nutrition, and increased safety and resilience. We're now tackling this from a different angle by targeting aging directly. This can surely bring not only a massive health increase, but also a radical increase in life expectancy. Often people seem to greet progress with hesitation. The tendency is to overestimate risk and underestimate benefits of emerging technologies. This is for the most part an irrational reaction. As countries develop, fertility declines and populations age, becoming a burden on society. Eliminating aging will solve this problem. We've seen that precision healthcare is on a trajectory of democratization. Advanced therapies are getting cheaper and more accessible. In view of the fact that eventually everyone will be able to access this technology, it is important to think about how society will reorganize itself once people stop aging. Being concerned about overpopulation is well beside the point. We value all human life equally, and we do not equate more human life to more environmental damage. Under that logic, the fact that we live to be 80 instead of dying at 30 from an infection already is a problem which is misanthropic at best and absurd at worst. And on top of this, imminent technological change will allow us to increase efficiency and produce enough food and energy for everyone. After all, the world is big and there is room for everyone once the individual footprint reduces. The future ahead of us will be incredible. If you'd like to learn more about any of these issues, Check out the link below or visit www.rationalmind.show for more information and resources.